Today we're going to talk about the idea of how do we actually worship? Like, how do we worship this Jesus? And the question I have for you this morning is, uh, what is your favorite thing to do in life? What is your ultimate favorite thing to do? Some of you are golfers and you love to play golf. Some of you are swimmers and you like the water. Some people like boats. Some people love vacations. Some people just love family and they just want to sit with family and watch TV. Other people love to go RVing or camping. Or What's your favorite thing to do? Maybe your favorite thing is making money so you can go do some other things. Maybe some of you can't make money and you're just stuck, you know, with what you don't have and so you make more investment in family and in the people that are around you. Some of you love to play cards and play games and just sit around and be with folks. Some of you love music and music just drives your soul. So the question is, what is your most favorite thing to do? And the reason I ask that question is because that could be the thing that you worship. That's called worship is when you love something, when you pour your heart and soul and your life absolutely into it, that's worship of that thing. The question for us who believe in God that have a faith dynamic in our life is, uh, do we put our worship in Jesus or do we put it in other things? Today I want to ask the question, how do we worship? Where, Where does it come from and how does it work in our life? One of the things I want to talk about is this idea that Jesus coming into uh, Jerusalem on this donkey was the very pivotal key to God's whole plan. This was the hub of the wheel. This is now the full culmination of Jesus' life, and it's the beginning of Jesus now starting his death. Let me back up the train a little bit. Do you remember when Jesus was born? And I don't know if any of you were there, but when he was born... What happened? His mom and dad were refugees. They actually had to go and escape and go to Egypt. And you know, they probably rode on an animal to get there. And now Jesus goes from there and he grows a little bit and there's not much written about his childhood at all. But when he's 12 years old, kind of like when Joey was up here singing, Jesus was in the temple and he was talking to the rabbis and the teachers about faith and God and questioning what they believed. Oh my word, 12 year old kid questioning what adult men believe. That's pretty bold. And then Jesus goes and he gets baptized by his cousin and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove and the the heavens open up and God says what? This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now Jesus lives his life and he does all these miracles and he gets to this point where now he has to kind of get near the end of his life. He has to start the clock ticking toward his death. So Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Do you know there's three kinds of people that kind of receive Jesus or approach Jesus this day? It's the people who rejoice in him, the people who don't understand him, and the people who reject him. There's three kinds of people in the world, people who rejoice in who this Jesus is, people who don't understand anything about it, and then people who reject it absolutely, and they say, Jesus cannot be God. I'm going to ask you later, where are you in this little paradigm? Let me give you some background on this situation. Uh, Beth Page or Bethany is about two miles east of Jerusalem. So Jesus was riding on this donkey for about two miles. It's a pretty long walk, really. It's a crowd of people who gathered. They had all been watching him do miracles. They had all been kind of following him when he gave out all the bread and the fish. You remember that? 5,000 some men and maybe 15,000 some people. Jesus does these miracles and people are gathering around Jesus. They want him to do more things because it's miracles are cool. I mean, I would want to be healed. I would want a root canal just totally healed by Jesus' touch. I would want to be healed from my blindness. I would want God to just instantly touch me. So I would probably follow him around. So Jesus is walking around, and these people are following him and chasing him. Here's number one, if you want to write down anything on your program. Number one is Jesus orchestrates the events of his death because he knows the plans. Jesus already knows the plan that's ahead for your life. He knows the plan that's ahead for his life. He's the one that's orchestrating this clockwork to work until he dies. And so he starts this clock ticking. He tells his few disciples, you saw it in verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it 
and bring it here to me. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying this? Just say, the Lord needs it. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Those who were sent ahead went and they found it as Jesus told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said, why are you taking my colt? And they said, well, Jesus needs it. So they brought it to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on it and, and on the colt and they put Jesus on it. That's just so interesting. There's a word that uh, is the meaning for this. There's a word in the day called angeria. And this is when a, uh, a dignitary of any kind could take anybody's property and use it for their purposes. I don't know what that's called today, but it would be like the FBI coming in or a police officer coming in saying, I need your vehicle. I need to take this right now. Is there a word for that today? What? Imminent domain. So, Angeria is the same idea. It's this, you know, Jesus needed this. And they would lift up the rabbi to this place where they could use property. And Jesus didn't steal it. He didn't take it forever. He just borrowed it for a while. It's interesting that it was a colt that was never ridden before. Do you know much about donkeys? Do you know my, what, what, what's that metaphor that we use with donkeys? Our what? What's the word? Adjective? Stubborn. Yeah, they don't want to actually be ridden. They're not necessarily a horse that you can break them and ride them easily. They're a stubborn little animal. And so Jesus said, go get that one and bring it back to me. And they did. I just think that's fascinating. All these events that Jesus is doing, is they're no surprise to him. Jesus isn't surprised that he's got to ride this donkey and do this thing because he's basically fulfilling this sequence of events that are happening. In fact, number two, if you want to write this down, number two is this. It, uh, Jesus receives worship from the people. This is the first time or one of the first few times where Jesus actually receives worship from people. Now, he knows he's God. He knows that he does miracles. He knows that he communes with the Father. And him and God are in this relationship that's a, a, a very close-knit relationship. Jesus spends all night sometimes praying to God and gets words from his Father, and he speaks words of truth. And uh, there's a few times where people actually worship Jesus, and he receives it. Do you know that most other things don't receive worship? When I go hit golf balls, the golf balls are not, like, receiving my worship. Does that make sense? When I go fishing, the fish aren't really glad that I yank them out of their environment. Uh, they're not receiving worship. When, when I go, uh, I enjoy driving. When I'm driving and just like going through the mountains, and it, my car doesn't give a flip about what I'm doing. Do you understand this? The money that I try to make, the, the pleasure that I try to find when I'm watching TV, when I'm soaking in that show that I just love because it speaks to my heart, you know, that This Is Us show that we watched last fall, that show doesn't care that I'm watching it. It doesn't receive my worship. Do you know that most things in creation don't receive your worship? They don't care. But Jesus receives our worship. That's a big deal. Do you know that all the false religions, those gods don't receive worship? Do you know Muhammad is dead? Do you know that the Jehovah's Witness, uh, Jehovah God, their God is not the true God and he doesn't receive worship? Do you know that all of these other false gods are just like this wooden chair? They're just inanimate objects. They're just things. But Jesus receives our worship. This is a big deal. In fact, in verse 36 and 7, it says this. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, and when they came near the place where the road goes, down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. They're worshiping this Jesus. They either want more miracles or they're actually fulfilling the prophecy, which is from Zechariah chapter 9. Verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. It's kind of like the red carpet, if you will. Do you know how we do red carpet events today? What are all the events we do red carpets for? The Oscars, the Grammys, the Emmys, 
the what? All, the Country Music Awards, all these things, right? And so all these shows, we throw red carpet out, people prepare all this stuff. It's this picture of how we sort of prepare for the celebrities to come into town. Do you know what kind of hurts me when I watch these shows? Is that that sort of feels like worship too, doesn't it? And it's like, oh, we worship these celebrities, these people who have made it in their life. But I haven't made it. I'm just lowly me, but I'll lift them up. Isn't that kind of how you feel when you're watching this red carpet shows? But Jesus receives worship because he is worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise. You know the thing that strikes me in this is that this donkey, this little animal, let Jesus ride on him, and he was worshiping Jesus too. Because all creation worships Jesus. Did you know this? As Jesus comes into this area, the triumphal entry, this humble animal, this, this little beast, submits himself to be ridden on. Uh, unlike most donkeys, like this kid trying to pull a donkey into church for their Easter service, <laughs> most donkeys are resistant to, uh, to actually, um, you know, what humans want to do. But basically, Jesus is riding on this humble donkey. Do you know why he rides on a donkey? You may have heard this before, too. Is He doesn't ride in on a gigantic, huge, white stallion horse. Do you know why? Because he's not the kind of reigning king that the people wanted him to be. He wasn't going to come over and take over Rome. He wasn't going to overthrow the government. He wasn't going to draw his sword and ride up to Caesar and kill him. He wasn't going to overthrow the government. He was actually humbly receiving worship and coming as the Lord's anointed. And there's a reason that they put the branches down on the road for, before him. Do you know this reason? Most times when it was uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, they would raise these branches and wave them around because they were, during the Jewish history, they were, uh, they were worshiping and they were looking for the idea of the end times to come. But this wasn't the Feast of Tabernacles time in the Jewish calendar. This was Passover. Remember what Passover is? From the days of Egypt, the days when all of Israel was released to go across the Red Sea on the dry ground. And this was the time where the Holy Spirit passed over Egypt. And if they didn't have blood on their doorpost, the firstborn would die, which is a picture of Jesus coming to die. But So this was Passover week, so they're looking forward to their forgiveness of sins. They're waving these branches because Jesus is both. He is the Messiah looking forward to the end time, and he is also the one who would forgive and take away our sin. But not everybody likes Jesus. Kind of baffles my mind. Not everybody accepts Jesus. See, there were these Pharisees that were there that day, and they rejected Jesus' worship. They actually said to Jesus, hey, tell your disciples uh, let they say, it says some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, hey, rebuke your disciples. Don't let them worship you because anybody worshiping you is like blasphemy and what do you think you are, God? He's like, yeah. In fact, he says, if they become quiet, what? Even the stones are going to worship me. You know what that means? It's not those little troll stones from the Frozen movie, you know, how like they turn into stones and they, it's not those guys. It's actually all of creation comes and worships God the Father, worships this Jesus. Creation even knew better than the religious leaders knew. Creation himself knew more than the religious leaders. We're gonna have a moment here. I'm gonna ask Alf to come forward and share a testimony with us about how God began to shape his life and change his life with worship. So, Alf, would you share with us? Hi, everyone. I'm Alf. Good morning. I'm here to talk to you about a time in my life when um, I had accepted Christ when I was about 15 years old. And I would come to church and go through the motions. I didn't really understand what worship truly was. Kind of still lived for myself for for many years. And I, I just remember a moment about... 12 or 13 years ago when I was sitting in church and I had my head in my hands and uh, I couldn't tell you what the pastor was preaching about and he probably thought I was sleeping. 
<laughs> so I was well known for that too. But, um, <laughs> but God touched me that day and it was like something hitting water and, and the waves in my heart rolled. He just kind of showed me who he was. And I can't put that into words. I just know that from that moment on, who God was to me changed forever. It allowed me to see that I wasn't worshiping someone who would speak to my conditions. Or he would, but that's not my reason for worship. I was worshiping God because he was the creator of all things. Holy and bigger than I could ever explain. That's, that's that testimony. This morning I woke up in prayer from a somewhat of a hard night. My prayer this morning was, Father, I want to speak of you with confidence, bold and strong, but I am weak and empty and feel like I can do no good. A dark cloud follows me and I feel sad and alone and I know your truth and that is my comfort. From my weakness, you show me strength. When I am empty, there's room for you, for your goodness. This dark cloud helps me develop character. And when I think I am alone, through your people, you show me just how close you are. When you are rejected, Father, I will be that stone that worships you. Mm. I thank you for these days, the dark ones, the hard ones, and for those glorious days that you give us when we are successful and we do feel strong and bold but i do remember in our weakness that is when god is the strongest hmm. thank you thanks man hey before you go <laughs> i want to pray for you can you put up that picture of those stones by the beach sometimes we feel like we're just a pile of rocks you know what i mean Sometimes in our faith, we feel like we can't do enough or God isn't there for us or God's just quiet for some reason and we're just really being beaten up by the waves of the ocean or by, by the circumstances of life. And I think with Al's testimony, I think what I hear is that you're just willing to be a rock for God. You're willing to just be part of his creation and let God wash over you and work you and God will receive his praise through your life. I'm just gonna pray for you and then I'm gonna continue a little bit with the passage. God, I ask that you would bless Alf today. Pray that you would, God, work in his life, that you'd heal him of uh, these things that he struggles with sometimes, some of his thoughts and some of the stuff that follows him. And I ask God that you would empower him and lift him and use him, Father, as he is a minister to our youth group, that, God, you would bless him in, in lives of the students. I pray too, God, that you would work through our church, that we would not... Uh, Father, feel lowly about ourselves, but that we would truly be lifted up as your creation, those that can praise you and lift you and worship you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna also uh, fill in number three if you wanna fill this in in your program. Jesus predicts the future. I know I talked about Jesus knows the plans ahead, but he also predicts the future in our lives, and sometimes we get stuck in the past, Sometimes we get stuck in the present time where we don't feel like we can move forward at all. But truly, Jesus knows the future. And you hear this at the end of the passage where he says to the Pharisees, really, if only you would have known what was happening. He says this, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, if you had only known. Are you ever in that place where you feel like, man, I just wish I knew more of what God was doing. If only I had known more of where God was going, I could trust him more. You know, there's a reason why God allows us to go through the struggle. I've preached on this before. God allows us to search for him, to seek him out more. And God isn't just silent because he's mean. He's not quiet just because he's trying to prove a point. He's actually wanting us to draw to him and linger with him and come closer to him. Although if you know the history of, of 
Israel, if you know the Bible at all, if you know at all what happened in AD 70, so about 35 years after Jesus said these words, Rome, uh, in fact, Titus of Rome, came and he overran the city. He besieged the city. He put a, a blockade, a siege around the whole city of Jerusalem. He knocked down the temple. He destroyed Israel's worship. And Jesus had said, you missed it. He said, I'm Jesus, I am God, I've come in the flesh to be with you, and you actually missed it. You're telling my disciples to reject me, to not worship me? You're actually missing the boat, is what he says. If only you would have seen through all the prophecies, through who I am, through the miracles, through all that I've done, you would worship God. But you missed it. And Israel was judged at that time for that. In fact, I read this this week. The decision to reject Jesus is a fundamental violation of God's covenant trust. The decision to reject Jesus is a fundamental violation of God's covenant trust. There's a word in Psalm 136. It's the word hesed. Can you say that? Hesed. It's God's covenant loyalty, God's covenant faithfulness with his people. If you read Psalm 136, it says... God's loving kindness forever. It says that a number of times. Every time there's a sentence, it says, because of God's loving kindness forever. That's his has said. That's his, his uh, eternal faithfulness to us, his people. But he can only go so far. If we reject that, we reject God. God can be loving and gracious and kind, but we have to receive that. I love reading this because there's really two options in this passage. Either receive Jesus or reject Jesus. Either receive the God in your life who has come to be worshipped and as we sing hosannas and praises to him, we come before him or we reject him. Luke, the author, really gives no other option. And the question this morning for us is, do we receive Jesus in our life as the humble king, this king that comes with peace and goodness and kindness, or do we reject it and we expect God to be something else? Do you ever expect God to do more in your life than he's doing? Yeah, God, if only you would heal me from this certain disease. If you'd only take this pressure away from me. If only, God, you would take away this uh, problem that I have, my marriage or my anxiety or my money or my family or my, my memories. And God doesn't take those away. Do you push God away because he doesn't just instantly heal you from things? Jesus says, come to me and worship me. I am a humble king. I want to walk into your life. So there's three options that I put on the board. How do we worship God? We can either, number one, rejoice in the Lord Jesus. We can worship him for who he truly is. Or we can sit and not truly understand and be neutral and try to just let it pass by and get by in our life. Or three, we can totally reject him outright. And say, no, I don't want to be any part of this. Did you notice in the passage that Jesus doesn't try to convince the Jewish leaders to follow him? Did you notice that? He just prophesies and tells them, well, it's too late. You had it before you. You read all the prophets. You knew the opportunity, but you missed it. Do you think Jesus is mean? Because he just laid it out there and he sort of stepped back and said, well, you choose. Do you think we have a mean God because he just lets us choose rather than fix and heal everything? Here's what Jesus actually said in John chapter 6, verse 28. He said this. Then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And Jesus says, well, you got to mow your neighbor's lawn. you got to give more money to the church. you got to make sure you do all the right things. you got to make sure that you, right? Did Jesus go into a list? What did he say? He said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he sent. Just to believe in me, to know me, to let your life be conformed to me. Like Alf was saying, one day God may tap you on the heart and open your eyes spiritually to say, oh, is that what this whole thing is about, is just trusting God when I am confused, trust God no matter what my issues are, and 
I will walk with God in faith. So here's the question for us before we pray. Who is Jesus for you? Do you worship him and rejoice in him and let him be all that God wants to be? Or do you kind of put him in this place and expect more from him than he's doing? And you, you're, maybe you're the one who's saying, Lord, I don't worship you for who you are. I worship you because I want to get all of this stuff from you. That's a question for us this morning. Let's pray. God, we come before you because you are God and you are holy and you're good. And I pray that you would tap our hearts like you did with Alf, that you would wake us up, wake our eyes up, God. Let us open our eyes and see that Jesus is the whole hope of our life and our salvation. God, there's many of us in this room who continue to run on the treadmill of life and we keep trying to earn more, trying to gain more, trying to become more so that you'll love us. And that's false. Many of us, God, want to be forgiven of our sins and we try and, and, and kind of hold that before you like you should uh, you know, constantly keep forgiving us. But the truth is you have forgiven us in Christ. I pray today, God, that you would move in our hearts and our lives that we may know you deeply, we may worship you profoundly, and God, we would sing hosannas and praises to you. I pray that nobody in here would reject you, Father. No matter how hard life gets, I pray they do not reject the God of all creation who draws us to love you and worship you. We thank you for Holy Week. We pray that you would remind us again of the death of Jesus so that we can rejoice in the resurrected life that is to come. We pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Everyone said, amen. So as you go this morning, I want you to think about this metaphor from the donkey. If you think about it, the donkey was owned by an owner, right? We are all owned by an owner. God owns us, and he wants us to be useful for his son, right? You can either be stubborn, and I could use words that I probably shouldn't use in church. Uh, you could be stubborn and be a fighter and resist this Jesus, or you could walk humbly with Jesus and let him use you in your life. Amen? Will you receive the blessing this morning? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen?